I'm not going to attempt that this morning. But love these words. Stand together. We'll sing it. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well. Never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come find in mercy. Come to the table. We'll satisfy. Taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for. God so loved the world that he gave us. Jesus is waiting, open up. God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. How will forever defeat him? Walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Brit says, Praise God. coming out of the hospital. Of course, Linda called and she said, Mom's getting out. Come on over. You ever get out of the hospital before? They don't mean it. They don't mean it. <laughs> They're just teasing. If they say today, it'll probably be tomorrow. If they say, hey, you're getting out this morning. It probably means sometime this afternoon. But hey, she got out. It was quite a gathering of uh, medical staff there. They came out and said goodbye and loved on her a little bit as she was making her way out. And it was, it was really fun because our niece, Jessica, was on the front step getting ready to go in. She was going in the hospital. She had a baby, a uh, baby boy on Friday, yesterday. So she was coming out of the hospital and Jessica was going in. We were just keeping busy, you know what I'm saying? But... Uh, I believe Sharon knows this song, and she was sure ready. <laughs> she was sure ready for that release date the other day, 
And you know, it made me think as I was, we were looking forward to that this week. We, we've got a release date right here, don't we? One of these days, we got a release date. We don't know what it's, what it's looking like, when we're going to get there. But one of these days, we really get to travel on. And my dad had a theory on that. <laughs> he said, you know, everybody talks about going to heaven someday and how great it's going to be. But few of us want to get on the bus. One of these days is coming. And you know what? I'm looking forward to the bus, PT. I've been on a lot of trips. You know I've been on a lot of trips. One of these days we're going to a place we can't even imagine. We can't imagine. Today he's given us today. He gave us that breath that we're taking right now. And what a gift that is. But one of these days we're going to breathe it on the other side. I can't wait. There is a first verse to this. And it goes like this. Do I have this in the key of E? I'm getting closer to taking this trip, I'm telling you, one of these days. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. No pain, no death. And to there, I feel like traveling. Sun outshine, I feel like traveling on. That heavenly man shall be mine. I feel like traveling on. Feel like traveling on. Feel like traveling. can have a seat this morning if you'd like. You know, they're in, uh, they're in Egypt. When the children of Israel were there, they were in captivity. We know the stories. Been there, seen the place. Amazing spot. I like to go visit. And I think they, I think they kind of liked it too, PT. I think they did. I think they kind of enjoyed it until there was a a new pharaoh that came along who didn't know Joseph. Mm-hmm. How quick history, huh? <laughs> didn't know Joseph. How could you not know Joseph? He's the guy who said, let's save some grain. Let's hang on. There's a drought coming, pharaoh. But there was a pharaoh that came along, didn't know him. And scripture says back there that the, the new pharaoh became a, a tough taskmaster. Man, he had him working. You know, if things never got tough, They'd have never wanted to leave. They'd have thought Egypt was all right. And they'd have never seen the promised land. So sometimes when when things get a little tough over here, I'm just saying, there's another spot. Feeling like traveling on. Kelly, did you know that song? 
Bernice, did you know that song, I Feel Like Traveling On? Had you heard that before? It's a good one. <laughs> this song, I sang it in Egypt with, uh, with Big Mike, Big Daddy Wee. We sing it here this morning. He's coming. Wayne's days, he's coming. Either one way or the other, right? Either he's coming or we're going. One way or the other. <laughs> we're going to get there. I love this song. It goes like this. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. Broken hearts declare his praise. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, Our God is the Lion, Lion of Judah, roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, Lamb that was slain, seed of the world. Blood breaks and chains. Every knee will bow for the lion. Every knee will bow for the lion. So open up the gates. It's way before the King of Kings. Our God who calls His saved. Here to set the captives free. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, Lion of Judah, roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before you. Our God is the Lamb, Lamb that was slain. Sin of the world, his blood breaks and chains. Every knee will bow for the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow for the lion and the lamb. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Thank you for this morning. Again, thank you for this time that we can come. We can be together as a church family. God, it's an amazing thing that you gave us rest last night. You gave us breath for another day. You gave us strength for this morning. It's a gift, and Lord, we thank you for it. And Lord, just be with us through the remainder of this day. God, fill us up with your word today. Make us more like Jesus before we walk out the door. And God, use us all day long to glorify your name. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more. I've been held by the Savior. I've 
still in Romans today, chapter 9, starting at verse 22, through 10, 4. I pointed this out in one of our studies, there you go, that uh, chapters are not part of original scripture writing, they were added to help us organize and find things. So sometimes we assume that when you get to the end of the chapter, that's the end of the thought, this is one of those exceptions and it all ties together, okay? Now, one thing we've been talking about, and I realize that uh, among my pastor friends, I'm the minority here, because I was raised in a particular brand, a method, a form of Bible study, and I've worked to get out of that for about 30 plus years now. It doesn't come easy. The way that you get out of a particular construct into trying to get back into the story is through Scripture. What has happened in my lifetime is most people do their Bible study not out of the Bible. They do it out of commentaries, Christian bookstore, uh, video clips, he said, she said, that kind of stuff. And so we all end up, and we need to understand, and Debbie, that's what I was talking to you about earlier, let me hold it up. Some of you might be interested in this. Called Counterfeit Revival. Okay, now it's always been there. This is written in the context of my generation and in particular the last 30 years or so. The last revival that I would call in our country a revival was the Jesus movement of the 60s. What always happens is when there is a revival, which is not a movement of God so much as it is of people relinquishing themselves to what God's already doing, okay? Reconnecting, connecting. 
And any time there, there is a revival spiritually of God's people, there is always, always a parallel counterfeit. The problem is counterfeits are designed for a purpose, to deceive and fool, slip something in, okay? So any time there is a doctrine that God is calling us back to, one of the very first thing, and that one more thing historically, throughout all of the church age, any time there has been a revival, if you go back and study revivalism, there is one key factor that is always there first and remains as the backbone. People rediscover the Bible. They start reading it, start listening to it, they start applying it every single time. That is why, those of you in the 9 o'clock study, we always start out when we are doing a study of doctrines or systematic approach to Scripture. You always start with Scripture, the authority of Scripture. Because if, if, if the Bible is not God's written revelation of himself, then it is nothing at all. and just becomes an arbitrary book. And that's what too many of God's people have made it today. They've made it into a, yeah, but I don't believe that way. We've done it in marriages. We've done it in economics. We've done it politically. Anybody not been hit yet, raise your hand and tell me what I missed. In any kind of human relationships, we always end up not going back to God's word, and therefore we begin to believe things that are counterfeit. They appear right. Where did all this start, by the way? Anybody want to give me a scripture reference? Genesis Thank you. Who was it? Satan and Eve. Anybody not catch that? <laughs> Isn't that what happened? Satan comes to Eve and said, that isn't what God said. You misunderstood. And he takes part of what he said and twists it and adds a little piece to it. Happens in every counterfeit revival there is. There's a core of truth, but the minute you add the wrong to it, it corrupts the whole thing. And that leaves people with enough truth to be dangerous, but it, is, it can take people to a religious experience with Christ and not a saving knowledge of Christ. Those are different things. Counterfeit revivals are always feel, filled, filled with feelings. And feelings drive the conversation, not facts. So every counterfeit revival appeals to how you feel, how you see things, your opinion. What do you think about? One more story, then I'll get to the notes. Years ago, that individual here, and one night during Bible study, said, well, when are we going to do Bible study? And I said, what, what do you mean? This person said, well, you know, we have a, a verse we pick out. We pick out. That was part of the key. To the, and then, uh, oh, Jay, what do you think about that? Elvira, you know, what do you think about that? Mike, what do you think about that? And I said, that's not Bible study. That's a shared ignorance session is what that is. That's where God's people are today. There's enough Bible in there to kind of uh, get us a little excited and start making, you know, what if statements and, and how about. But it takes us away from the truth. And so we start seeing things the way we want them to be seen and not how God wants us to see. At that point, his Holy Spirit is not leading, guiding, and teaching us. We're just throwing out what we think. And that's a dangerous place to be. So what we're going to deal with today is something that is, um, I'll just call it what it is. It's a plague in the church. And I would say 90% of all churches hold to what is called dispensational theology. That's what they have been raised in. Not covenant theology, close, similar, but dispensational theology, where the Bible is divided into historic sequences. And when you approach then the book of the Revelation, not Revelations, that tells me real quick how you understand that book. 
and you begin to talk about the churches, the seven letters, dispensational people will without fail because this is what they've been taught. We are the Laodicean church. This is the end of the world, except it's not chronological. And every single letter applies to every single generation. And if the shoe fits, you wear it. It's the truth. Okay? So we can't take the first. If we truly were the, the, the Laodicean church, then the first six letters are irrelevant to us. And that's far from the truth. Boy, take those six letters out, and you have done away with six because each letter follows a form. It says it describes who Christ is. It describes who the people are. It describes something that God is upset with them about, except for one of them. And it describes an action to be taken. It also includes a promise if you take that action. Let's go back and read it. As those of you who have been through this with me before, we have a matrix, okay? And we have those different columns, and we have those different churches. We start filling in those things. I need to know the characteristics of God to the first church, to the second church, to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. I can't just simply say this is the end. We're the Laodicean church, and then we totally misunderstand what hot and cold means. It's a reference to a geological environment the church was in. They lived where there was hot thermal springs, and they also lived beneath mountains that had snow and melted. And what the people wanted was either hot water to wash, bathe, clean in, or cold water to cool and refresh. What nobody wanted was lukewarm. So by the time you got it out of the mountain streams, you wanted to pipe it in so when it came into your home, which they did have indoor plumbing to a degree, you got cold water and not lukewarm. Or if you wanted the hot water and you didn't have the means to fire it up with the steam and all the Roman baths and all that sort of stuff, again, hot water clean stuff differently than cold water, right? So he said, I wish you were either useful for cleaning and bathing or useful for refreshing and quenching thirst. I don't want you to just be lukewarm. I'll just spit you out because it's no good for anything. It's not useful. So that's the reference to that. We need to know some of those things so we can begin to apply it in the right way. We're at this point again. I pointed out last week, one of the big mistakes of the church today is to reference Israel of today as God still owes them. And it's called double covenant theology, dispensational theology. And basically, it is taking certain verses and saying, well, this happened, but not that. And it's really restructuring scripture. Uh, I know this because I was taught that, and that's how I taught it for years and years. Beck knows, right? And you start taking a piece from here and a piece from here and a piece from here, and you put it together and make up a new story. Well, you would not do that. Any, You wouldn't take a, a page out of a science book and a page out of a, a, a journal and a page out of a novel and a page out of the dictionary and put it together and make one story out of it. But that's what we're doing to the Bible. We're taking it out of its context. That's why we're going through Romans. What are we going to go through next? I've already told you. Hebrews is next. What follows Hebrews? Why? Those are the three doctrinal books of the New Testament that straighten out our theology. Not with, I'm not talking about worship practices or anything. I'm talking about biblical worldview. So what has happened today is there's a group, and I, I threw the word out last week without a whole lot of definition to maybe provoke you to go and look it up and see what I'm talking about, Christian Zionism. What it says is this. Israel of today is reconstituted by God's divine act for purposes of fulfilling an unfulfilled covenant with his people. The covenant was interrupted when Jesus came. And the Jews stopped believing in the Messiah. They rejected their own Messiah. So, and I'm in dispensational thinking, okay? This is not, this is not correct what I'm saying, okay? I want to be clear about that. And the church then became the parentheses 
in between the Abrahamic covenant and the stopping of it and at the end being fulfilled. And the only way it could be fulfilled would be physically and literally that God would put his people and pull them from all nations and reconstitute the nation of Israel. So last week, what we looked at is the difference between from the previous part of the chapter, Romans 9, there's a difference between Israel of the flesh and spiritual Israel. Two different things, two different outcomes. If you put your hope in Israel of the flesh, you have misunderstood Scripture, you've put hope where hope is not, and you've missed the whole point of the Israel of God is made up of people who worship him in spirit and in truth. They have, been heard, they have heard the gospel. They have come to the cross of Calvary. They have entrusted their life to Christ for forgiveness of their sin and his love. And the church then is the Israel of God, the new Jerusalem, as a city coming down from heaven adorned as a bride because the church is the bride. Is that literal sequential? No, it's painting a picture of spiritual truth, what God is doing. So, as some of you in this room, self-included years ago, we would scan through all of the news articles and watch news every day to see what God was going to do next and see how it tied to Scripture. And then we would have questions like, well, America's in the Bible. I said, it is? Where? Well, it talks about the eagles. Those would be the Romans not Philadelphia, okay? Eagle has nothing to do with America. We'll talk on the way home. <laughs> I'll, I'll lose again, so. Thank you. No pride here. <laughs> What we do is we take where we live today and superimpose it on history of the world that God is leading and guiding. Nations rise and nations fall. Nothing new. We take Daniel and we start applying it to us today, even though when Daniel is left after the dream about the different creatures coming, the beast and say, he says, I don't know what that is. He's scratching his head. He's heartbroken. The angel comes and says, let me tell you what it means. And he is specific. He says, that animal is the media, the, the Mede empire. That one is the Greek. That one is the Persian. That one is the Romans. He tells us exactly who it is. And yet we take it and we ignore that part of the passage. We go back and we're scratching our head and we start making stuff up. This is this, this is that. It's not. One more example before I give you notes. Over in the Revelation, it talks about candlesticks and stars, right? What are the candlesticks? Don't make it up, look it up. Isn't that one of my favorite sayings back? Don't make it up, look it up. You got a computer in your hand, it'll look it up. The candlesticks are the churches. What are the stars? The pastors. The angels? The pastors, not spiritual angels. The leaders. How can I figure that out and prove that that is correct? Because six of the seven letters say, I have this against you. If he's addressing a angel of God, how does God have anything against his angels? He doesn't. Then we're taking a word that simply means, angelos simply means message, messenger, depends on noun or verb, okay? A letter to the messenger, the church of, here's who I am before you. Here's what I have against you. Here's what you need to correct. As you correct it, here's your promise. Follows a pattern. So we don't have to make it up. He even tells us because, because John asked the question, what is this that I'm seeing in this vision, in this revelation? And the angel once again says, the candlesticks are, the stars are, 
the angels are. He tells us. We don't have to make it up. He's very clear about what it is. So we need to approach Scripture that way with clarity when clarity is, is there, okay? And sometime back when we were doing apologetics, defending your faith, one of the, one of the issues of the church today is not that we don't understand Scripture. We just don't want to obey it. And so when Jesus says, love one another, we have all kinds of stuff we tie to that, don't we, in practice? Of course you love people like yourself. They kind of act like you and think like you, and that's kind of a scary proposition. Ultimately, we need to go to God's word, and we need to, when it is clear, it is clear. When it seems a little mysterious and cryptic, I'll pretty much guarantee you there's an answer in there. You just got to know how to find it and don't make stuff up. If we can figure out how to get back to the Bible and basics, I bet you what follows next is what I started the whole conversation with. What is coming next? Revival. It's the only way it's going to happen. The more we keep butchering this and misusing, mishandling it. Okay, so here's the discussion right now. God has started saying through Paul in Romans 9, there is Israel of the flesh and Israel of the spirit. And he makes a distinction between the two. And then he throws out a big what if. And it's a huge what if because if we simply look at it through human emotions, we would go, boy, God set them up. He, set, he made them that way. No, remember Judas? Did God make him a traitor? He simply used the traitor that was already there. That's important. Okay, so here is, at the, we're in the middle of about a three-chapter argument here, so you've got to go back and keep reading through this. What if God, remember last week we talked about the potter and the clay, and he said, uh, if the potter wants to make vessels of wrath, who are you to disagree? If he wants to make uh, containers throw trash in, who are you to tell him not? If he wants to make uh, uh, vessels of mercy and put them up on a shelf and look at them, who are we to question? He is the potter. We are the clay. We are actually the broken vessels. So what if God, willing to show his wrath, this is out of 922, to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Who is he talking about there? It's very specific. We've been studying it out of Matthew 24, Luke 19 the unbelieving Jews. They became vessels of God's wrath. And he destroyed the temple through Titus, through Vespasian, surrounded the place, killed over 1.2 million people over the space of basically a summer. Temple was obliterated. The stones still are laying on the ground on another piece away from the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall is the only piece that has been excavated. It didn't look like that, okay? That was excavated as Israel was reconstituting after World War II. They cleaned the site up. So to think that that's what it looked like after the destruction, not true. There's a lot of stuff on top of it that fell down and littered everything. They left part of it cluttered as a reminder of the judgment that came against them. They cleaned up one spot and said, this is where we will once again cry out to God to see if he will hear our voice. Here's the whole problem. They've never called out to Jesus. They've never accepted the cross. The Messiah is not the Messiah. They're looking for another Messiah. So they can wail at the wall all they want until they come to the gospel and hear it. They're in trouble. So one more big statement. The Jews do not need Israel or Jerusalem or the temple. The Jews need Jesus, plain and simple. Just like I do, just like you do. All of us need the one and only gospel 
There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. You can't say, but I'm a child of Abraham, but I'm a Jew, but I live in Israel. That won't save you, okay? So he, he's saying, what if? Now the second one, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared to glory. Oh my goodness, he just said, I destroyed that group to make a point. When I destroyed them, in destroying them, I revealed this other group of pots, the vessels of mercy. And it was God's plan all along to do this. And see, that doesn't make sense to us, right? If God knew that Eve was going to do what she did and Adam was going to do, why didn't he cut it off right there? Wouldn't that save everybody a lot of trouble? That's not the plan. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It is the giving of our will to him, surrendering, submitting to it that he is looking for. God wants people who worship him because they truly choose to worship him. Now he's, he's again, remember who's writing this. Paul is writing this. He's the Jew of Jews. He's the Pharisee of Pharisees, right stock, right lineage, right everything. He had been out decimating the church before he met Christ on the road in his conversion. Even us whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. One more piece to keep in mind in this whole unfolding. The first church was made primarily of Jewish people that accepted Christ. They were the remnant for that generation. Each successive generation has a remnant. God always has a remnant. We are part of a remnant of those who were not his people before he gave himself to us so we could be his people. We were not the receivers of the covenant or the prophets or the law. The Jews were. And so what is happening here is God is I don't know how else to express it. He's almost setting them up. He's saying, you who were my chosen, who had every advantage under the sun, I gave you everything and you threw it back in my face. And you know these Gentile dogs over here that you hate so much? That would be us, anybody that's not them. I'm going to make them my children. What do you think of that? You know what they thought of it. They hated it. They didn't like it at all. And so then we later on get into this the whole discussion of, okay, if Jesus is the root and Israel is the branches on that root, and Israel, because of unbelief, the branches were cut off and cast aside, and branches that were wild branches were laying on the ground, and God stuck them into the root, and they took on life, and they became as though they were original branches. The argument then that Paul continues to lay out is, Okay, if God can graft branches in that didn't belong in the first place, you think it's really hard for him to take original branches that were cast aside, and if they call upon the name of Christ, he could save them? Don't get stuck in the country. Israel is made up of Muslims, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Arabs, and everything else under the sun. It's not a pure group by any means. It's sure not a spiritual group by any means. So to think that the geography here is what the fight is about and what we're seeing on the news right now, it's the wrong discussion. The discussion should be, what do you do with Jesus? And that's never going to end up on the political table. They were just in the wrong, you know, it's kind of like, hey, I thought we came here for the game. Yeah, but we came here to play football, and you went to the baseball diamond, okay? Good try, but wrong place. Same thing, wrong conversation. And the church is being caught in the wrong conversation and focusing on we need to be friends. What? Okay, if I want, I have my own reasons for being preferential to one group or other, my own upbringing, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, God divides this world into two groups. What are they? Saved, lost. That's it. That's it. 
Want proof? We've already looked at it in Romans. Therefore, in Christ there is no condemnation. Why? Because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Christian Zionism just got thrown out, if you're paying attention. Neither male or female men. <laughs> neither slave nor free. Whoever comes to the cross becomes a vessel of mercy. Whoever does not come to the cross becomes a vessel of wrath and will join these vessels in verse 22. He was patient and long-suffering and finally destroyed them. And that's what we've been studying the last month or so in our Zoom stuff. Okay, now, gosh, we're finally taking notes. Okay, ready. Okay, we will hit hyperdrive. No, we, no, we won't. First, number one. The Gentiles, that means non-Jews, anybody, any pagan, anybody who was not raised in the ceremonial law that was not birthed into that bloodline and all that, that's, that's who we're talking about. The Gentiles believed in Jesus by faith and not of their own righteous works. Gosh, the church is stuck there today too. First bullet. Because of Israel's unbelief and rejection of Jesus, a way was made for Gentiles, the unbelievers, to come to Christ through the righteousness of Jesus. Now, there's a big statement in there. Today, we are made righteous only because Jesus is righteous. That's it. We have nothing to offer God except trash and garbage. And Isaiah is pretty clear, right? Even your righteous deeds are garbage before God. So what do you think the bad stuff is like? Because of Israel's unbelief, a way was made for us. Now, I commented last week, and I, I hope some of you caught this. I was talking to Alfred one time, and he said, you know, I understand, and I'm studying more and more the history of the American native and its many, many, many groups who were warring against each other long before anybody else showed up. we got to remember that part of the argument, okay? He said, here's what would have happened. Had we not been made subservient and he was raised in boarding school and you pretty much had the native beat out of you literally and to be conformed he said but here's what I've learned to to appreciate had that not happened I wouldn't know Jesus today because the gospel would have never come to the native people it's wisdom and he said, so now I'm at the point, I want my family to have the same, and they won't hear it. Because of his own past is part of it. They just won't hear it. God is willing to sacrifice one to save many. He did it through Christ. He did it through the Jews, too. He said, I will make an example of you. I will absolutely make an example of you. And your destruction is coming. I'm coming in the clouds, and they're not clouds of the second coming, okay? It's not what we sang this morning. That's another event. The first event was he's coming in the clouds of judgment and wrath, and the Roman army surrounded the city and obliterated it, just absolutely obliterated it. What shall we then say? That the Gentiles who followed not after justice have attained to justice, even the justice that is of faith. Yeah, exactly. By faith in what Christ has done, you come to a saving knowledge of Christ. That's it. It's not hard, and yet it is hard because it means you have to submit yourself, right? Second, second bullet. Israel, and I'm talking about Israel geographic, reconstituted in 48 over in the Middle East. It is serving a purpose. It's just not what I, I don't think it's what we think it is. I think there's something else going on here. Israel cannot be saved by keeping the law. They cannot be saved because of heritage. They cannot be saved because of their culture. They cannot claim as they did to Jesus, hey, but our father is Abraham. And Jesus said, nope, your father is the devil. Abraham wasn't even a choice. The Abrahamic covenant was to Abraham and his seed. And when we get to Galatians, we're going to find out who and what the seed is. You've already heard this before. Who is the seed of Abraham? 
Jesus. He said, not as to seeds as in many, but seed as in one. Jesus is the seed. That changes everything about how you interpret the scripture. Changes everything. And I'll say it one more time. Jesus is the fulfillment and the focal point and the center of all of the spokes of all of history, of all of time. He is the core of everything. Israel's part of the story. The church is part of the story. Today, we either focus on Israel, or we focus on the church, or we focus on worship, or we focus on this or that or this, but we don't focus on Jesus because we haven't really been taught, I guess, or considered. He's the core of everything. Romans 9.31, but Israel, again, historic, religious, Israel, by following after the law of justice is not come unto the law of justice. Let's reword that. They tried their best to do their best and they failed. They tried to keep the law and they failed. And Jesus was clear. He who breaks any part of the law is guilty of all. Yeah, but the rich young ruler, but, but I've, I've followed the commandments since my youth and I've, I've, Love God. Okay, then go and sell everything you have and follow me. Well, I can't, I can't do that. His heart was exposed very quickly. Let's look at the second part. The Jews, historic, national. Maybe insert in that, if you make that distinction, this is the Jews of the flesh, not the Jews of spirit, okay? Maybe that can help. That's probably an easier way to do it. The Jews of the, of the flesh, historic, cultural, religious, etc. The Jews who were seeking after justification by their works were rejected by God because they stumbled upon Jesus the rock, the stumbling stone, who justifies believers by faith in his righteousness, his holiness, his sinlessness, his power and authority. And the minute we walk this game of, well, you're in control, sorta. You know, might as well have. Beck is in control while she's driving the car, but I always attempt to assist. <laughs> Sitting in the front seat. <laughs> You know, the only the only way I know to do this is just take a nap. <laughs> okay, just cl close my eyes because when yeah when you're the driver because most of us here we drive ourselves around all the time and we drive our own vehicle so we know how it you know it's when I'm in the truck I don't pull into the little bitty space in between all the other you know you might have a 30 foot turning radius I've got about a 45 foot turning radius and I know how to do it exactly on certain things on Main Street because if I don't hit it right I will hit the curb and if I do it right I will clear by inches but I can do it fast or slow doesn't matter because I know it but I get into Beck's car and I go oh my god what is this <laughs> first off where's the shift I mean it's just it's foreign so when I'm the passenger I'm not seeing it the way she's seeing it every day. And I forget that. I forget that. Talk among yourselves on your drive home. First bullet. God rejects those who reject him. Plain and simple. God saves those who come to him through faith in Jesus. In Christ, there is neither Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, or free. Whoever comes to the cross is made equal in the justification and righteousness of Christ who fulfilled all things that we can't because he paid the debt that we can't pay. We need to know that. God then does not send anyone to hell. He honors people's individual choice. And he does not do it with glee or joy. 
when Israel was judged and obliterated, he didn't do it with joy. It's just simply holiness must judge unholiness. Always has been, always will be. And since we don't stand a chance on our own, we must turn to the holiness of, of Christ. We must turn to the sinlessness of Christ to be our sin for us on the cross. We have to, we have to do that or there's no other way out. Romans 9, 32, 33, going into the first verse of 10. Why so? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were of works, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of scandal. Your version may say offense, but scandalon is the, is the word, and it means just that. Christ coming into this world and becoming the sinner is a scandal. And yet it was a God-made, approved scandal that God should become the sinner and die for my sin. Being God, he wouldn't stay dead. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered the power. He conquered the enemy. Everything's been made right. When I come to Christ, everything is made right. We're just not quite there yet, right? We're not to the final chapter. We're, we're working on it year after year. Brethren, the will of my heart. This is Paul speaking as a Jew of Jews. And he's talking to his fellow Jewish unbelievers. Brethren, the will of my heart <clears throat> indeed and my prayer to God is for them to salvation. That should be the prayer of the Christian today, that the Jews find Jesus and the Arabs and the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the the lost, right? Shouldn't that be our prayer for people to find Christ? Because otherwise it's an eternity of, of lost separation. <clears throat> we don't even like to think about it because it's, it's bigger than we can understand. <clears throat> now he hits a point under that same one, and this is where the flow goes into the first uh, next couple verses. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. What did he just say in modern language? I know a lot of religious people. They call themselves Christians, and they're pretty much just religious people. They have a lot of zeal, but not according to knowledge. They don't know Scripture. They don't understand the plan of salvation. They don't understand who Christ is. They confuse it in all of the rhetoric about Israel today, and this is that, and this is that, and we're, we're connecting dots, but they're the wrong dots is what it boils down to not according to knowledge, and then he's going to define what that knowledge is in the next verse. I don't have to make it up. For they, not knowing the justice of God, that's the knowledge, that God is just in dying for our sins. He did the right thing. We are now in good standing with him because of the righteousness in Jesus that has been imputed, put into us by declaration of God himself, and seeking then to establish their own. They have not submitted themselves to the justice of God. How do you do that? How do you submit to the justice of God? It's actually quite simple. You accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord and admit that you're a sinner before him and you're in desperate need of him and you're born again. That's how you submit. You see, that's the one thing that the Tom of the flesh doesn't do too well. Right, Beck? Amen. That's a real big amen. But every, I'm learning this about our grandchildren, too. One of them is fairly compliant. The other, oh, my God, is like me at that age, and I'm number two also. And I'm going, I already know where this one's going. Basically a kind heart, but a hard-headed head <laughs> to go with that. So, some of you are the same. If I tell you you can't, I can just see, I can see your back rear up. Your eyebrows, your eyebrows are changing right now. And it just happened. It just happens. And if somebody says you can't, by golly, the fight is on. Now, that can be a good thing if you're fighting good battles because you won't give up. You'll be like a, you'll be like a, a bulldog. You just won't 
nobody can stop you. If it's for godly stuff, that's a good thing. If it's to defend your own position just because you want to win the fight, it doesn't end well. It always ends up, God will win whether I think I just won or not, right? It's like the smart aleck boxer just before he gets knocked out. Just before. So do the third part then. <clears throat> Jesus fulfills the law of God completely. The ceremonial law, he did everything that a good Jewish person would do to obey the law. And yet, as he started his public ministry, he didn't violate it. It was just misunderstood. They accused him and his disciples. Oh, my goodness, you walked through the field and you worked on the Sabbath day because your robe was threshing the grain. And Jesus said, don't you remember David and his men when they were hungry? They broke into the temple and ate the showbread. Was there any fault in that? No. Then just back it down a little bit. There are some areas in life where I will give more latitude than I ever ought to, and there are other areas that I get resistant in. And oddly enough, one of them would be back when we're walking the streets and we're going to go to the other side of the street. I don't jaywalk. She does. I go to the crosswalk. I stay within the white lines. <laughs> but, there, but there's other stuff that you would go, wait a second, you're doing that, but you're doing, what is wrong with you? Well, I've been asking that for a long time. Pardon? Uh, pretty much all the time. Either speeding or we're going up to Denver and Stan's going, brother, we're never going to make it. <laughs> 25 miles an hour. Can we go? Can you give it a little bit of gas? Just a little bit. Or it's 90, right? Going to Vegas <laughs> in Jerry's truck. <laughs> okay. Old stories. Oh, my goodness. Here's the truth of Scripture, Romans 10.4. The end of the law is Christ. Stop being a Christian who has to keep the Ten Commandments and do this and not do that. In Christ, it's all been fulfilled. Now, is that license to do what you want? No. Exactly the contrary. Just realize he has done the work. Therefore, okay, be careful with what you do with that one. The end of the law is Christ. He's talking about the end of the ceremonial law and the judgment for broken moral law, which absolutely we all are guilty of. Unto justice to everyone that believes. We are made just and righteous with the righteousness and justice of Christ because he has done the work. He has put an end to the goodness, badness thing. Who goes to heaven? Go to any funeral. Guess what the average person believes? Everybody goes to heaven. And that's coming from the mouths of Christians. And that's just not so. I wish it weren't so, but that's just not so. First bullet then, Jesus in the flesh fulfilled the ceremonial law of the Jews. What was he doing at his bar mitzvah after his celebration? Remember that part of the story? He went to the temple. He's 12 years old. He's teaching the teachers, and what did mom and dad do? They lost him and forgot where he was. They're going home, and then they're having a discussion. Well, Mary, I thought he was with you. Well, Joseph, I thought he was with you. Well, where is he? They, get, they just hit the panic button. They go back to the temple, and there is their new young man, at his, the age of manhood, teaching the teachers. And Mary just kind of scratching her head and saying, I've been told who he is. Now I'm starting to see who he is. And she kept doing that all through his life, all the way to the cross, right? 
He fulfilled all of the moral law demanded to God. Was Jesus tempted? Yes. Did he ever fall? No. Tempted as we are, in the same ways as we are, yet without sin. Boy, that's the kind of Savior we need. Absolutely. We cannot, and that's why Hebrews is going to be so important, George, because as our priest, he's, he's kind of been there, done that. And he's already won all of the victory and all the battle. So he stands as a completely holy priest, always running interference for us, declaring we are his. Yeah, it's a big word. He fulfills everything, so we don't have to fulfill it. Again, that doesn't mean that we are just cut loose to go do whatever we want. Isn't that our struggle every day? To obey or not to obey. To speed or not to speed. To mask or not to mask. To have steak or not have steak. To have ice cream before meal or not. Uh, whatever really tough decisions you make during the week, right? By faith... We accept what God has given to us. We ask his blessing. And we go with what we've got. Leave it at that. Rather than all the stuff that's out there today that you need to be blessed and you need to sow a seed so you can get a payback because God can pay back much better than the bank, don't you know? That's very tongue-in-cheek as far as the financial part. Sometimes he does, sometimes not. Sometimes he says, you want to play that game with me? Watch, I'll lo you will lose everything, Job, but you keep your faith. And in the end, in the end, I'll take care of you, but not until you've gone through the testing. So that, that's, that's a tough one. God provides to you the way you need it. God provides for me the way I need it. God gives to you the grace you need for today. God gives to me the grace I need for today. And tomorrow, he will do it all over again. Last bullet. To all then who surrender their life to following Christ, and I wish it were all or nothing, but it's much more of um, Jesus offers us a gift and we want to hold on to self. And he says, well, give me you. Well, I give you me except for that part and except for that part and except for that part. We start making deals with God. Anybody played that game? Oh, Lord, if you just take away this stomach flu right now, I'll even go to church on Sunday. I might even help somebody this week. Uh, God doesn't make deals like that, <clears throat> even though I've tried. To all who surrender their life to following Christ, which is a process and exactly that, a lifetime of surrendering. The righteousness of Christ makes them right before God. Here's what I need to know out of that last statement. No matter how much I mess up today, I still belong to him through the cross. He is not, thank you, Jay, he will never leave or forsake you. He will in no wise cast you out. He is not the kind of Savior who's the lifeguard on the beach and says, here, catch, and throws you <laughs> a little donut. Or if he hits the target and then he starts reeling you in and then gets right to the end and says, you know, I think it's lunchtime and let's go of the rope. What kind of Savior is that? He is able to save to the uttermost, completely. He who began a work in you will finish it. Gosh, we need to know that. We need to know that. Israel's unbelief is so that we might have the possibility of belief. Can the Jews be saved collectively? Well, we're going to hit that chapter coming next. Uh, I would say this, we will tend to, when we get to that point, we will tend to approach that as looking for an event. I think that will be a mistake. I think what we will look for is a sharing of the gospel and a final taking the veil off. Now, does that mean 
and all, when it says, and so all Israel will be saved, he's talking about every person? No, he's talking about spiritual Israel. All who are foreordained and chosen in Christ and who have submitted to that, and God knows who they are, it will be complete. The body will not be left unintact. And when that happens, that's the end. Because the last person has entered into the kingdom that will. Only God can possibly know that. It's just an impossibility as lives are born and lives uh, die every day. It's, uh, it's strictly up to him. He will know when the time is right. So I don't want to make the mistake of always looking for an event because then I'll start searching through papers and news and social media. When it happens, it happens. And for us, we are to be watchful and waiting so that we're not too embarrassed when the Lord gets us. Oh, it'll absolutely be a surprise. The outcome's not a surprise. We already know that. So we should have anticipation. Every generation should have, have anticipation that Christ is coming again. Every generation. But every generation so far has gotten it wrong. So that should tell us that it's following a wrong method. Yes. It was when David wrote it, because we need to remember who wrote it. Now, when you go back and read that, Psalm 122, how does it start, Roy? You want to start it? Just the first verse. No, go backwards to verse 1. It's all one psalm. It's not part of a psalm. Okay, stop there. I learned that verse as a little kid. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Does geographic Israel today have any interest in that whatsoever? Then he's not talking to them. He's talking to those who come to worship collectively. And Jerusalem, the physical city, is compacted together. How is the church made? Same way. Jesus is taking these living stones and he is compacting. In other words, he is placing them exactly where they need to be to function in the right way. He is building a living Jerusalem, a living city. And I was glad when I get the opportunity to worship God, to be here with you today, his people, to sing to him, to study his word. I'm glad to be here. Nobody beat, nobody beat me and made me come. Maybe at a certain point in my life, years ago, with a threat, if you want, okay? But that's not it. So Jerusalem is the city of peace. And we are to pray for the city of peace. And here's the difference, Roy. We have taken Jerusalem of the flesh, which stopped existing at least twice in history. Actually, well, twice. Babylon destroyed it. Nebuchadnezzar, they were for 70 years. Took them almost 100 plus 50 to get back. The whole process was 120 years. Okay? The second time was under Rome. And Jesus was clear about that. This isn't going to happen again. He walked out of the temple, and what did he declare? This your house is left desolate to you. He left physical Jerusalem. He left the physical temple because his Jerusalem is as a bride adorned, as one coming from heaven, not from earth. Okay, don't turn that into an event as such either. It covers the entirety of church history. He is adorning his bride right now as he calls one more peace into the family, one more peace, one more peace. So to pray for the peace of Jerusalem is to pray for the peace of the body of Christ, to be unified in faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God in all, through all, 
in y'all. That's unity, not sameness. What is lacking in the church today? Because we are not praying for the peace of spiritual Jerusalem. Because we have the NAR movement, we have the oneness movement, we have the holiness movement, we have the, the crazy this, the crazy that, all kinds of new forms of doctrine. People getting their ears tickled and their tummies scratched with all kinds of bad Bible. I don't know how else to say it. This is bad Bible. Because the context has been lost, the history has been lost, the culture has been lost, the covenant to Abraham has been reinterpreted, and everything has been changed. And that drives the industry of the retail church of today, which is very sad. We need unity of faith, not sameness. That would be a progressive model. Let's all be the same, except for me. I own everything and I will dispense it unto you. When's the last time you prayed for unity in the body of Christ, the peace of Jerusalem? Maybe never because we've not been taught that at all. You ever seen God's people fight? If you've ever been in a church, you have. <laughs> Oftentimes it's over very significant issues like what kind of carpet we're going to put down? What color are we going to paint the building? I've seen it. I've been there. It's, it's just not, that's, no. Now, the other part of that, Roy, and thanks for asking this, is to pray for the peace is not to accept all people as they are, but to pray toward that unity of the faith in Christ. Therefore, when I'm with my brothers and sisters in Christ who worship differently than me, that I would call heresy in many, in many places, I can still worship with them to a point. I know when to leave. Some people don't. They get caught in the trap. So, yeah, what would happen if the body of Christ in Farmington was unified? What would happen if Jerusalem and Farmington were unified? What would happen if we returned to Scripture instead of all of the aberrant doctrine and theology out there? What would happen? I think the answer is clear. Salvation and revival. Are we there yet? I, at this point, I don't think we're close. I think COVID was uh, a little bit of a slap to try to wake us up to a degree, and um, it's added more confusion in many areas than anything else. So yeah, the peace of Jerusalem is the Jerusalem of God, heavenly Jerusalem. That, again, go, go back to Galatians. When we get there, George, he's going to make a difference. He's going to say, Jerusalem of this world, and the heavenly, he's going to make a distinction just like he does in Romans. There is Israel of the flesh and Israel of the spirit, and they are two different things. And we're not discerning that today. We need to figure that out. Good question. Let's pray. Father, help us to keep wrestling with your word, not just out of our own ability but of your spirit teaching us, but help us to know that th there are better tools to use to study scripture than, than, than some of the ones that are being used today. Help us to make up our mind to the degree that we can to allow you to have your way in our life, to have you teach us the things that are lacking, to show us the things that are, are not there that need to be there, to help remove the things that don't belong there. All of us have these issues in our life today. Help us to turn to your word. Help us to, to see that the spiritual always is bigger than the earthly model. Jerusalem of this world was simply a type, a shadow, a pattern of the heavenly Jerusalem found in Christ alone as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, as your city of peace because you are the prince of peace. Help us to pray then for the peace of Jerusalem through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, stand one more time. Sing with us just before we go. 
Ask me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, Lord, do not pass me. Thank you. 